comes on, great. If it doesn't, great. Yeah? We yeah. could worship God without computers in the past. We can worship Him without computers in the, in the present. Amen. I believe my wife has a sound for us this morning. our hearts, fix our minds upon Christ Jesus, your son. Let whatever else is going on, wherever it is, it will just take no precedence, no preference, but let us just concentrate and solely think upon you, consider you, and give you the glory, give you the honor, give you the praise, give you the thanks. Open our minds, open our hearts to your words as we expand upon your word later. Remind us constantly of the wondrous gospel of Jesus Christ. Our Saviour. Empty us of things of this world. Let us not be concerned with what's going on. But let us be more concerned with who and that is you. So Father, I pray right now that you lead us, you guide us only by your Spirit. That you would be lifted up, you would be worshipped, you would be adored, you would be praised. To your glory and to your honour. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to start the old hymn, so I'm sure many of you may know this one anyway.
take up the offering and see if we can get the full 50 worship and continue with the worship later. You may take a seat again. <coughs> Blessed the show.
very seated. Again, welcome to everybody, and welcome. I think we're online now, so for a while. As you probably gathered, it smells nice in here with paint. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Brother Derek uh, Dennis for for all his hard work. He's been painting, scraping, filling, filing, doing everything. So he's been uh, he's been working hard this last week or so. And uh, the white ball there that's on the back that will be finished this week. Um, it's not just a white piece of wood. We'll have something on there shortly. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this for this gathering here this morning and, and just thank you for allowing us to, to be here. Your word tells us that without you we can do nothing. You are the giver. You are the sustainer. You are the provider. You provide with every breath. You provide with every heartbeat. You provide the very oxygen that we breathe. You are everything. And without you, we can do nothing. And Father, we thank you that you left us your word. We thank you that you've given us your truth in your word. Not the way the world sees the truth, but the way that your truth is. And you are the ultimate truth. You are the truth. And I pray that as we work our way through this teaching, preaching, this book this morning, that it be your Holy Spirit that illuminates this word to each one of us, to our hearts and to our minds, that we can apply it to our everyday lives. I may be the messenger, but may you, Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Christ resurrected, may you be the message, the message of your gospel, the message of your salvation, the message of your mercy, of your love towards your creation. May it be you, Jesus. The glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to open your Bibles to the book of Jonah, we're going through uh, the book of Jonah at the moment. We're now currently in chapter 3. This is for us, part 5. If you'd like a Bible, we've got Bible, if you'd like a Bible, we've got a Bible. It's going to be on the screen anyway, so if you have yeah. other buttons, you can look at the screen, as long as the computer keeps going. <coughs> so we're in uh, Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. 
So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil ways and from his violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? <coughs> then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. The second time. Remember, God had uh, called and commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh to cry out against the city. We read this in chapter 1 because of their great sins, but Jonah hated the Ninevites. Jonah did not like the Ninevites at all. Because for many years the Assyrians had murdered, had persecuted, and intimidated his people. So Jonah wanted nothing to do with them. And he surely didn't want them to repent of their sins. And he surely didn't want them to be forgiven by a mighty God. So Jonah decided to run from God and to run from God's command. And we know that he, he fled for Tarshish, but God sent out a great wind and Jonah was thrown overboard. And when it was found out that he was the cause of the storm, they unloaded the whole ship, they threw him out as well eventually, and he was swallowed by a great fish. By all rights, that should have been the end for Jonah, that should have been it, it should be finished. But our God is the God of second chances, amen? We don't have to read very far in the Bible to discover that God forgives his servants and he restores him to ministry. This is a constant thing in the Bible. It's God's mercy and his love and his more than second chances. We can recall Abraham, don't we? He fled to Egypt and lied about his wife. But God gave him another chance. We can read about Jacob who lied to his father Isaac. But God restored him and used him to build the nation of Israel. God gave him another chance. Moses was a murderer. He killed a man. He fled from Egypt. But God called him to be the leader of his people. God gave him another chance. Peter denied the Lord three times. But Jesus forgave him and actually said, follow me. God gave him another chance. Thankfully, Today, God still forgives and gives us another chance. We mess up. We are sinful in our nature. We will make mistakes. But God will restore us if we repent and say sorry. In verse 2 it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So gracious he was in giving Jonah a second chance. God again commissioned him to go to Nineveh, which he told him, Previously, Nineveh is notable in the Bible as a capital city of Assyria, and it was a long-time enemy of Israel. The city was actually built by um, Nimrod, the great warrior, who also built Nineveh, but he also built Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Resen. So he was a great builder at the time, Mr. Nimrod. Nineveh was known for its great wealth, it was known for its power, it was known for its prestige, it sat on a very prominent place in the peninsula, and it was also known for its polytheism, it worshipped many, many gods, different gods. And the Assyrians themselves were, were notable 
for their cruelty and their idolatry. That's brought out in Nahum 3. We can read about that. Nineveh contained many temples. One was included to uh, Ishtar. That was a multifaceted goddess who takes on three forms. She's the goddess of love. She was the goddess of sexuality. And accordingly, therefore, then also fertility. She was responsible for all life. But she is never a mother goddess. There was always a god above her. But she was well worshipped in Nineveh. She was also the goddess of war and was often shown with wings and bearing weapons, bearing arms. As well as many other gods and deities that they worshipped, Dagon was also a prominent influence, and we'll look into Dagon a little bit later. We read in chapter 1, verse 2, God said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. We know that God told him to arise, but what did Jonah do? He didn't arise, did he? He went down. He went down to Joppa. He went down to the lower part of the ship. And he eventually went down into the ocean. So he was disobedient. This does not specify exactly what the serious wickedness was, but it does state why Jonah was so fearful. We can get a vivid picture of a serious violent early 8th century status and consequently the trepidation that Jonah must have felt today thanks to various archaeological discoveries including inscriptions, uh, wall reliefs and other artefacts. I've got a picture here, this, uh, if I get his name right, this is the statue of the king, of an Assyrian king. He was, uh, his name was, if I say it properly, <coughs> Asur Nasifal. Asur Nasifal. There you go. And he was, uh, a century earlier, he was the leader of the Assyrians. There's another picture here. This is taken in the, from the British Museum. And then that's him. This, these were taken from Assyria before, unfortunately, ISIS destroyed a lot of it. But these were taken from Assyria and kept in the museum. This is uh, Asnipal's face, but on a lion's body with wings like a great warrior that he wanted to be. You can see how great and grand they are. And that passageway is a huge corridor with artifacts that have been saved and rescued from, from that area, from Nineveh. Okay, so we have a wall relief, which is the next picture. So that shows, that's what we call a wall relief. So this, this was on the walls and all over the city, showing their great victory, their great warriors, and so forth. And then we've got another one here. Recognize that? Yeah. Anyone that's watched any war movies in the Second World War, you'll probably recognize the wings and the eagle. Someone else used it, didn't they? with a swastika in the middle. It denotes great power, sovereign power, and it denotes fear. And then we have one more picture. This is another wall relief. This was uh, depicting the Assyrians impaling the Israelites. They used to impale them on a, on a pole up their bottom, okay, up the rectum. They would impale them on the pole and if they impaled them correctly, they would stay alive for days in pain and agony. And some of them, they would be skinned alive. And their skins would be hung up. This was how evil Nineveh was. This was Nineveh. Yeah, so this was just, and they glorified in this. This is why they made these wonderful, what we call war reliefs, to say to people, look how powerful and strong and great we are. So the king was known for hanging enemies on post or impaling them, flaying them, lining the city walls with their skins. He also burned his enemies. He beheaded them. If they were fortunate, he beheaded them. As with others, he would have them still alive, and then he would cut off their noses, cut out their ears, cut their eyes out, and other extremities would be removed while they were alive. And he would try and keep them alive for as long as he could, so he could torture them. That's how much... The Assyrians hated the Israelites. Now, we can see a little bit now from Jonah, can't we? 
Jonah, the prophet of God, is being told to go to Nineveh. No wonder Jonah said no. No wonder he ran in the opposite direction. It's no, uh, no wonder that, is it? And it didn't, it didn't stop with his king, his son, Shalmaneser the third. He continued as a picture here. These are the, find the same place. These are the gates. These are the actual gates that um, was a, a city near Nineveh called Bulwat, Bulwat. And it's the huge gates. But on these gates, you can see these lines. Well, each of them lines have got a bronze uh, embossment on them, a picture telling a story. And we've got another picture with the close-up. This is on that on the gate. And this depicts the heads that they've cut off and where they're cutting off their hands and their feet. Well, they're still alive. Evil people, eh? And that really happened. And when you see some of the stuff that they get up to with ISIS, yeah, yeah, you know what they get it from. Barbarian people that hate with a vengeance their enemy. So that shows their, their heads and being hung from walls, impaled captives, and they were skewered and put on like totem poles and displayed throughout the city. So this was a terror. This was a real terror that was faced by enemies of the Assyrian empires at the time of Jonah. So you can imagine when the Assyrians invaded a country, that even probably before they invaded, the people were already surrendering, giving up, or just committing suicide because they didn't want to be captured. The Assyrians sought to keep their empire together by a way of extreme terror. Now we can understand Jonah a little bit, eh? We can understand him. We can understand why he didn't want to tell them that God is going to destroy them. Can you imagine that? You're, you, are going into the city, and going to say to these people, my God's going to destroy you. I don't think you'll be too keen. We can't even do normal evangelism. So I don't think you would have been worried about so much of that. Jonah's uh, Nineveh is thematically connected to Sodom, another biblical city of evil. We read about that in Genesis 18 and 19. God tells Abraham that the outcry of Sodom is such that he must go down to investigate, Genesis 18, 21. Similarly, God sends Jonah to Nineveh, the great city, telling him to, that, that the evil has come up to him and he must go down to it and warn them. The word actually was used as overthrow. It's the same word that was used in Genesis and the same word that's now used in Jonah. His prophetic preaching to Nineveh in Jonah 3 4. So in verse 3 he says, To Jonah arose at last. Jonah went and done it. And he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three day journey in extent. That's a, uh, a real contrast to what we read in. Chapter 1, verse 3. If you remember chapter 1, verse 3, we read that Jonah ran away. Now in chapter 3, verse 3, Jonah's running too. What a change. Jonah obeys. In chapter 1, he disobeys. A big city, a metropolitan city, the size of Nineveh, we looked into it on the first, um, the first teaching that we went into, had a circumference of about 100 kilometres. So that would require about three days to, to cover the whole distance. We reckon approximately 30 kilometres a day is the distance a person can normally travel by walking. And we can only assume that he walked, he didn't have any kind of chariot or horse or cart or anything, but, um, but he was walking. And these are the, the dimensions that are confirmed by historians through the excavations that they've carried out to the present day. So he would have been three days, normally, in a big city. The protocol was to enter the city on the first day. On the second day, to go before the, the council, or the main council, to ask permission to be in the city and to give the word. And then on the third day, you'll give your message. But it appears that Jonah 
was in such a hurry to get his message out that he didn't bother with the, with the protocol. He went straight in and started proclaiming. The size of Nineveh is actually expressed in terms of the time it would take Jonah to carry out his assignment. Remember, he would be going to all the public places, the places where you would go to, town square. We know that it had squares, it had gardens, and it had many wonderful places, temples. He would have gone to all the prominent places to preach the word. And his itinerary would have included many of the dozens and dozens of gate areas where several temples were, but where people gathered. In verse 4 it says, And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and then it shall be overthrown. So on the first day, he starts proclaiming. He probably thought, I'm going to die. I might as well get the message out as quick as I can. I think I would have thought that same, same way. So he didn't wait. He didn't do the protocol. He didn't walk around the city, check things out, or get comfortable. He went straight in and proclaim it. When Jonah was preaching the message to the people of Nineveh, there was no love in his voice, was there, by the looks of it. He cried out and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all he said. That's all we got written. We don't know whether he gave them the story, a gospel. We don't know whether he told them the story of the great fish, the storm. We don't know any of that. We, none of that is recorded. All we have is that he basically gave them the facts. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He showed no concern for them. He didn't plead for them to turn to God. He didn't uh, say, you must turn to my God. He didn't even mention repentance. As it was not Jonah's hope, I guess, that these people would repent. I would think Jonah was quite happy to be in the knowledge that they're all going to die. God is going to judge this city and they're all going to die. In fact, he would have been so afraid of them because their reputation, he would have known that. He didn't want them to repent, he wanted them to perish. So he said nothing to them except destruction within 40 days. The truth is that they knew that Jonah hated them. They knew he was an Israelite. They knew he was a Hebrew. And he wanted them to perish. They would have known that. That would have been common, common sense to them. But they knew also that his message was from God. Jonah was the first missionary ever. The first missionary to go into a Gentile nation. The first one to proclaim the news of God into a Gentile nation. When Jonah's coming to Nineveh was a sign of God's judgment. But what do we see when we read Jonah? We see judgment. What else do we see? God's mercy. God's mercy. God's grace. The message Jonah brought was short, simple, and it was one of last judgment. You're going to be destroyed. It was straightforward. His message simply was God is going to judge you for your sins. I think now, if the Ninevites were listening, now they would be scared. Now they would get worried. Because in verse 5 we read this. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. So they believed God. Only God can make someone believe. Only God can turn that heart, only God can turn your spirit, only God can turn your thoughts, and only God can make that happen. There is nothing else, no one else, that can occur that to happen. So the people of Nineveh believed in God. This is, this is really interesting. Don't we read that Abraham believed in God and was accredited was to him as righteousness? <laughs> Faith? Don't we read that? Therefore, they also came to faith. They also came in to believe. The Assyrians in Nineveh worshipped, among other things, Dagon and his female counterpart, the fish goddess National. And the images of this fish god guarded the entrance to the palace of the temple of Nineveh. As we know, Jonah did not go straight to Nineveh, but he had to be brought there, didn't he? Via a strange transport, miraculous transport, of God providing a great fish. That would have been full of meaning for the Ninevites. That would have meant a lot 
to the Ninevites. We have no account that anyone witnessed his arrival onto dry land, but there is that possibility that someone saw Jonah being vomited from the fish onto dry land. Do you imagine that? I think if you've been vomited out of a fish after three days, you'll probably lay on the beach for a while or wherever you are to get your head together. But someone who saw it, maybe that was on the cliff top, would have run straight away, looked like, hey, guess what I've just seen? You know, or maybe a bunch of them. So they would have gone straight to the city. We've just seen a guy come out of a fish. A man. It's been delivered to us by a fish. And that's that possibility. Or we have the, the, the possibility of the sailors. Remember the sailors on the ship that threw him over? They had to throw him over? Well, the storm ceased the moment they threw him over. So it's natural to assume that the sailors, that actually they've got no more cargo anymore, they've got a beaten up ship, probably would have returned to dock, wouldn't they? They would return to the port where they would have also given account of this Hebrew who, when he prayed to his God, the sea had calmed, the storm stopped, and maybe they saw him swallowed by the fish, we don't know. So there's a few things that we can think upon in there. We know that the Ninevites also worshipped this fish God. So they may have been pretty impressed, actually, when all of a sudden this fish man walked into their city, maybe they suddenly thought, we better listen to this guy. He's from our God, from that one. He was probably a bit smelly, probably had no colour to him, he'd been bleached by the intestinal fluids, but maybe he looked weird, maybe he sounded weird, but they certainly took notice of him. Remember that when the storm ceased and sailors were saved, and what did they do? They worshipped immediately the, our God. Mm -hmm. They worshipped him and made vows to him. They were converted. They were converted. So the God of Jonah, maybe this story had already gone ahead of Jonah. They could have taken him a few days to have reached him but from where he, he got spat out of the fish. We don't know that either. But notice here, the text says they believed God. Not Jonah. They didn't believe Jonah. They believed God. Reminds me of Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by what? By hearing and hearing the word of God. Jonah was the messenger. He was the prophet. But what was he declaring? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So they didn't believe in Jonah, they believed in Yahweh, in God. Now everything's changed. What does this mean? What does that mean that they believed in God? It means they responded to the word and the claims of God. They may not have had much knowledge of him, same as we don't have much knowledge of him. But they knew he was all-powerful. He was powerful enough to judge them and to destroy them. That it led them to submit their life and their will to God. By proclaiming a fast and putting on a sackcloth, they outwardly displayed repentance, something this nation would probably not have uh, done easy, repent. Therefore, they would have then proved their faith by their repentance. How is it you prove your faith? How is it you, you know that you're a Christian? How is it you know, apart from what you read and what you know, it's that you grieve over your sin, that you're aware of your sinful nature, and it saddens you, it destroys you, it brings you down when you think just how sick you really are and how wonderful, forgiven, and great and mighty God is. That is how we know we're saved. If we don't worry about our sin, then I would worry about your salvation. If you go through life and you go and do certain things and get involved in certain things and it doesn't worry you, then I'll be concerned. But we all make mistakes. And thankfully, we've got a God of what? Second chances. Merciful God forgives us when we come to him and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Real faith results in repentance, and repentance results in faith. It's an ongoing circle. Where there is godly faith, there is repentance, and where there is godly repentance, there is godly faith. Second Corinthians seven ten. What does it say? I think I've got it on the book yet. The godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. That means when you're sorrowful because of the consequences of your sin, that is worldly repentance. When you're sorrowful and repentance of how you've offended a mighty holy God, that is godly repentance. When you understand that you've broken his commands and you've broken his heart, he's looking at you and going, no, not again, please don't. Not that you've upset your mum or your dad or someone. It doesn't really mean that. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. That means people grieve over their sins. This is what was happening there in Nineveh. They were understood. The message was clear. Now we're grieving. Now we're sorrowful. The sailors told us the story. We heard the story. This guy is a Hebrew. We know the Hebrew God forgives. Yeah, they would have known all this. When they impaled these people, do you think they were quiet about it? Like many of the martyrs today, they were probably declaring their God. Even while they were going through agony and pain, they would have still been declaring the word of the Lord. In verse 6 we read, In the word of the Lord, when the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, wow, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. So sackcloth and ashes were used in the Old Testament times as a symbol of shame, as a symbol of mourning, and as a symbol of repentance. By taking down and taking off his robe and laying it aside, that would mean to say, I am no longer the, the king, in a way. I have no longer authority. Someone has more authority than me. That someone would be God, Yahweh. So now he's in the same course. Someone wanting to show their repentant heart would often wear sackcloth. They would often sit in ashes. We read this a few times in the Old Testament. And they would actually put ashes on top of their head. In fact, I think in some Eastern countries they still do. I think we see it sometimes on the news, don't we? When someone's died and they're going like that with the ashes and they're throwing them over their head. It's still a custom. And it means to say you're repenting, you're sorrowful, you're in shame, and you're in mourning. The sackcloth was a coarse material, not the nice sacks we get today, but they were made of goat's hair, the black goat's hair, very coarse, very, very hard, and it would have been very uncomfortable to wear. So the ashes actually signify desolation, ruin. I'm finished, I'm done. I would imagine a very fearful moment for Jonah, for Jonah now the king had heard. The king has got word of the fish man. what is going to happen to the fish man. I guess the, the king's response was not what Jonah was expecting, that the king would actually repent. Because this man had been claiming judgment upon his people. Yet we also read that this vicious evil king, not only did he repent openly before the people, because they would have had a fear of destruction, that he himself become an example of repentance and humility. Let's read verse 7. It goes even further. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything, do not let them eat or drink water. But let, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. As the sailors had cried out to their gods with no avail, the, queen, the king quickly realised that this one God was more powerful than all of his gods and all of his deities. doesn't matter who he worshipped now, this Dagon and Ishtar and all the others were not responding but this powerful, one powerful God is about to respond. And the king puts everything down. Can you imagine the panic going through the streets? If you put yourself back in their times, that dusty, hot, dusty,
nasty atmosphere. People running around, screaming, hollering. We're going to die. We're going to perish. Destruction's coming. We've heard what happened in Sodom. And this is going to come. It's going to happen to us. Can you imagine? Would you try fleeing the city? Well, I'm still in Nineveh. I still took part in that. This God's too powerful. It doesn't matter if I run away. Jonah tried to run away, but God still had his will done. So you can imagine. Declaring a city-wide fast at the time of mourning that was even extended to animals. That's a bit strange. What was the point of depriving animals of food and water? They didn't need to repent, did they? Animals that had no soul. They, they had no understanding of the God. No, they didn't. But their owners did. So, as the animals got hungry, the bleating of the sheep and the crying of the other animals would have been a reminder to them in their ears that God and his nation is turning itself in humility and repentance towards God. So, with all the panic that was going on in themselves, with everything that was going on around them, then we've got all the animals hungry, thirsty, making a noise. You know what it's like when you don't feed your dog for a few hours? Yeah, they cry and howl and cats sort themselves out. But the other animals would have been weeping, bowing, moaning, maybe even dropping dead. We don't know. In fact, it was a Persian custom, when we look into it, that they used to use animals in mourning ceremonies. And to some extent, we still do, don't we? If we see a, uh, a regal funeral, Normally the, the hearse is pulled by what? A horse. A horse is. So it's, it's still there. Usually a black horse and it's covered in, in mourning blood. So we still do, to some extent, use animals in, in these times. So in verse 8 he says, He carries on, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. The king's royal warning was straight to Nineveh's most prominent sins. Evil. The king could not deny now that they were evil. They were an evil nation, an evil race. Physical violence, social injustice. <sighs> social injustice. We complain about social injustice now. Social injustice there, you never. I don't think you would have got away with a protest there. But these are all hallmarks. In verse 9, we read. King, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? They could only hope. And that hope was joined with praying and fasting. They were desperate for God to relent and they just about done everything they thought they could do. Will God relent or will he destroy? We need to remember this in our modern day Christianity. Because all we hear from the majority of churches and evangelists is God is love. God is love. God is love. Yes, he is. He's also a judge. And he hates sin. And he's going to come back. And he's not coming back to cover the world and go, oh, you're all so lovely. What does it say he's coming back for? To judge. God, Jesus, is coming back to judge. God's a God of judgment. He's a judge. The judge. He holds the truth. And he knows. Nothing's hidden from his son. He will judge the wicked and the faithful. Exactly what's going on here. And this is a picture, once again, that we can see in this, what they class as a silly little book of Jonah. We see God's judgment, yet we see his mercy. We see Christ Jesus all the way through. Christ Jesus, the mercy of God, the attributes of God, his love, even to the most wicked of wicked of wicked of wicked of people, that he's going to give them a chance. And we may not like that, but we're not God. And we can never say that we're not wicked, because we are wicked. And then it says in verse 10, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, 
and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. They escaped. This is interesting because the Bible never says anywhere that Jonah's message included any mention at all of God's mercy. But mercy is what they received. Is that not what grace is? Undeserved favour. Amazing grace. Do you deserve God's grace? No, you don't. Do you deserve God's judgment? Yes, you do. Yes, I do. Yes, we all do. But God in his mercy gives us grace. Wow. It's clear that the Ninevites, by putting on their sackcloth and ashes, it wasn't just a show. This wasn't just, I'm sorry, Lord, I've messed up. Attitude. This was a real down in the dirt. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My eyes have no more tears to cry, yet I'm still crying. That is the repentance that they would have shown. So God saw a genuine change, a real humble change of heart. And it caused him to relent and not to, and not to bring about his plan to destroy them. Their repentance and their fasting. There's three things here. Fasting, which means to go without food, was in order to tend to the spiritual matters. Maybe it's time to cast aside their gods and to worship and give vows to the one and only true God. The second was prayer. Prayer and fasting go together, just as repentance and faith go together. So they were praying, and they're praying to this God of, of Jonah. Please, 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 please don't destroy my family. Don't destroy my wife. Don't destroy my children. Don't destroy my grandchildren. They're innocent of all this, but blood is on their hands. They threw themselves upon the mercy of God in prayer. Prayer is the last resort of the sinner, yet it's the first command of the Lord. Let's read that in Romans 10, 13. What does it say? For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is calling on the name of the Lord? Is it not praying? It's praying, isn't it? Call on the name of the Lord, the Lord shall be saved. They didn't just stop eating, they stopped eating because they were far more concerned about their survival than what they were going to put in their tummies. And then obviously there's a third element there's fasting, there's prayer, and there's confession. They knew what they'd done, and they were now confessing. God relented. True repentance doesn't take sin lightly. We are saved by faith in Christ alone. Not from works. The sackcloth, the ashes, would have resembled in many ways works. But Christ alone. God's mercy alone. It's God who grants us repentance. God's the judge. You can say sorry all you like. But if it's not genuine, God knows. It's not full. He can say you're pardoned or you're not. He holds the scepter of truth then. He is the judge. Guilty. We're all guilty. I'm guilty. Except by Jesus. It's not possible to come to the Lord unless he brings you to himself. He is the instigator. We are called, we are chosen by him. The Bible tells us, you did not choose me, I chose you. Some people don't like that. They think that we should have the right to choose. But that's not how the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you, we, are chosen. Destination. I don't know that. We'll do it. Well, what about my brother? What about my sister? What about my dad? My mum? It's not for you to decide. God chooses. He makes the choices. He makes the decisions. Repentance is the result of true salvation in Christ. God commands all men to repent and to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, what are we to do? We are to tell the good news. 
We are to be the lights in the darkness. We are to be evangelists. We are to be theologians. We are to spend time in prayer. To spend time in study of the word. Not just read a few verses a day and go, that's it, I've read my Bible for today. I went to church and I took my Bible with me and I read the passage and I leave it on the side for another week until I find it. And that's not being a Christian. And that's not living the Christian life. Genuine repentance will lead to a totally different attitude and relationship with God. If you truly are repentant. False repentance well, it never leads to a turning away from sin. False repentance is exactly that. It makes you feel good for a few years. Maybe a day or so, a week, a month, or whatever. Then you'll go back to it. Or you'll go back to it even worse. A.W. Pink is a famous preacher, teacher, author. He wrote this. He says, it is not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it which distinguishes the child of God from empty professors. The word professors there is not meaning professors as in teachers. It means people who profess. People who profess the truth. It's not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it, which distinguishes the child of God. Do we grieve over our sin? Are we heartbroken that we've broken the heart of our father? He grieves over us, those of us that are parents. Yeah? Just take a small snapshot of when your child, your son or your daughter, has done something that has completely broken you. How it hurts you. Well, we are made in God's image. God feels the same. How it must break his heart and his creation, who he gave his son for on the cross. He's disobedient. It must be bad enough. But when that son, that daughter, is going in to do something that is going to cause him more harm, that's sin. It's going against the will of God. In the Hebrew text, Jonah's message is only five words. Yet God used those five words to stir up an entire population. From the king on the throne to the lowest peasant in the field, even the donkeys and the horses and the God gave the people 40 days of grace, but it appears they didn't need that long. What does that mean to us? And this is our application from the Word of God today. We get the impression from this message that the very first moment they saw Jonah and heard his warning, they listened and they paid attention. They didn't ask questions. Get the impression they paid attention. So where's where's this mean to us today? How long do we ignore warning signs? How long do we procrastinate? Do we sit and think, well may that may not happen? Well, that one that never happened to me. This will never happen to me. I'll never get cancer. I'll never get this. I'll never get that. What happened to me? I'll never fall into sin. I'll never disappoint God. I'll never upset my children. I'll never upset my husband, my wife, in a way that's going to cause grief. You see the warning signs, and there's a warning sign. I, 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 I. God forgive me. God protect me. God guide me. God lead me. That's what it means to make your vows. That's what it means to be a Christian, a believer. Dependent not upon you and I, but dependent upon God. God, that it never happen that I forsake my husband and I forsake my wife. Protect me from the sinful world around me, the temptations. Every day in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. How long do we ignore warning signs? How long do we ignore warning signs in our health? Us guys are the worst. We get back, I think, going for weeks, months, years. And eventually we can't walk one day and the doctor says, well, you know, you've done this. Why didn't you come when it first happened? 
Well, we don't do it. Because we what? Frightful? Or we just get on with it? But we do that as Christians as well. We see the morning signs, the internet, the images that come up in front of us, the, the games we may play, the, the killing and slaughtering people. It's nothing. It's, it's only a game. It's only a game. Not really, is it? Because the idea is more than just a game. The idea is that you can kill people and get away with it. And the idea is that if you get killed, you get up again. And kill more people. All the games now, all about killing. Kill, 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 kill. Anti God. Anti Christ. Anti Christian. That's the truth. God gave them people 40 days. How long do we have to have until we see the signs? Do we respond quickly and positively? Or are we going to walk around unlike the Ninevites? Until, bang, judgment. Does our heart break for our loved ones who ignore the warnings? We have brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, cousins, aunties, uncles, friends, neighbours who ignore the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not your fault, but have you told them? Have you given the warning, like Jonah? Have you gone in? to a hostile environment maybe and sat down and said guys I need to tell you the truth God is sovereign over all and you're in sin and you're going to die in that sin and you're going to spend eternity in hell Ooh, that won't get me invited back for dinner will it but that's the truth are you prepared to be a Jonah and come out with the truth you're going to be destroyed repent, turn because it's up to God whether the people listen to the message and respond but you have a voice and you have the word of truth and you have a responsibility to declare that truth as I have a responsibility to declare the same truth here so are we going to ignore the warning signs are we going to just accept our brothers and sisters and girlfriends and boyfriends and mums and dads are going to hell no, I'm alright I'm saved. Jesus loves me. Yeah. Well, sorry. I won't be seeing you up there. Mm. Wake up, church. Time is short. You may have told them the gospel, they still resist. Or maybe you haven't told them the gospel. Do they know about your faith? Do they know that you're a believer in Christ? Do they know that you have a Bible? Or is it a bit of a secret thing? Fasting, praying, confession. That's what the Ninevites done. That's what we should be doing. This is what we can learn from this silly book of Jonah. This junk book. God's faithfulness, God's love, and his repentance of judgment upon those who turn. We can pray for our friends, we can pray for our family, and we should, and you should be on your knees praying for those who don't know Christ, begging God to save them, as if they're one of the Ninevites, to pull them out of the gates of hell. It's all you can do. Tell them the truth and pray. You are not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be your helper. Amen. Let's stand and finish on one song. Okay. Okay, I'll just clarify one thing because my wife has brought a good point. Some people take the book of Jonah to be a junk book. Mm. Okay, they think it's a humorous, laughing thing book that God put in there to show his sense of humor. When they talk about the giant fish and, and the other book. 
Mm -hmm. As we've been going through the Word, we've seen that the Word of God actually stands firm and true, that it wasn't just a whale like we see in the pictures that was flapping about on the surface and happened to swallow Jonah, but God prepared in advance the storm, God prepared in advance the big fish, and God prepared in advance Jonah's mission. That wasn't and it isn't a joke book.